Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. The Bible says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hands of the enemy. Father, we thank you because you are our God. You are our Savior. You are our Redeemer. You are our helper. You are our keeper. The, the, the Bible said that the sun shall not smite us by day, nor the moon by night. He said, He shall preserve our going out and our coming in, even from henceforth, even forevermore. So today we stand here believing your word and trusting in your word, trusting in your spirit and trusting in your son Jesus for our salvation. Without him, we are nothing. By him, we live and move and have our being. We are the apple of, of your eye. And we are the sheep of your pasture. Yes. We enter into your gifts with thanksgiving and we enter into your course with praise. Yes. So today we are thankful and we bless your holy name. So have your way with us today. Let your word come alive in our hearts, our souls, our spirits, our minds, our intellect, our will, our feelings, our emotions, our, our affections. Let every part of us be touched, our body, soul and spirit fully and totally by your word today. Immerse us in your word. Fill us with your word. Cover us with your spirit. Guide and protect. Keep us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Give us power. Give us strength. Give us an, the anointing. Give us the ability. Give us the unction. All these things we ask in your precious name. Amen. 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 Today we say that it's not by might, not by power, but it's by the spirit of the living God. And I'm happy Amen. to be here again. Amen. Thank God for everyone that is hearing my voice. Thank God for them. And may God give you a portion of blessing. We want to continue with this our topic, the doctrine of election still. And um, last week we had dealt with prepare beforehand for glory. Prepared beforehand or prepared before or for, however you want to put it, for glory. We are being prepared. That's found in Romans 9, 23. But today we thank God. We want to continue. We want to get into some other things. And we had, we had mentioned this scripture, Matthew 13, 10 to 17. We want to just lay, lay it again that at the foundation, the starting point. Matthew chapter 13, from verse 10. Hallelujah. Amen. And the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Mm -hmm. He answered and said to them, Because it had been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Why? Because you are being prepared before for glory. That's why God gives you the ability to understand the parables, the mysteries of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. We are going to a new place, a new kingdom. And if we are going to go to a kingdom, we must, we must know the rules. We must know the regulations. We must know what is necessary. What are the demands? So we are being prepared for glory. We are being prepared for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. For whosoever has, to him more will be given and he will have an abundance. But whosoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, the ears are hard of hearing, the eyes and the eyes they have closed, you see, and their eyes they have closed. Who closed it? Yes. Themselves. Not God. Lest they should understand with their heart and turn, so I should heal them. But blessed are the eyes, blessed are your eyes, your eyes, for they see. You are being prepared before for glory, so your eyes will see. Your ears will hear. You will not be dull and hard of hearing. You will hear. If you hear the voice of the Lord, you answer, you listen, and you take heed. So that's what he's trying to say to you. Blessed. You are blessed when your eyes can see and your ears, they can hear. 
For surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see, and to hear what you hear and did not hear. Now I want to read something here, and I want to read verse 18 and 19. Actually, 18 to 20. <coughs> Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. If you didn't understand it, there is an explanation. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. He that receives seed by the wayside. He said a sower went forth to sow. A preacher of the word went forth to preach the gospel. In, in the time of Jesus, and well, if you, would, if you would look at it from this perspective, consider in a village where there are fields upon fields that are prepared for planting, sowing, seed. And between the fields, there's a, a walkway, a pathway. Because in the villages, there weren't tarmac, like uh, concrete uh, or like, let's say asphalt roads. They were like dirt. Yeah, rough roads. Dirt, dirt road. And they would pass between the fields. So when a sower goes forth to sow, he, 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 he scatters the seed. That's right. And in throwing the seed, some seed will fall on the pathway. Or the, I will say the roadside then. I have a lawn and... To prepare the lawn, you have like a little machine. It 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 turns. You put the seed in it, or if you want to put if you want to put uh, fertilizer in it, it's a container, and you and you turn a handle, or you can roll it, and it's and it, and, you, and there's a there's a wheel that spins inside with a hole at the bottom, and as it spins, it it dispills the seed out or the fertilizer out in a pattern, or you can treat with your hands. But some always go. On the sidewalk. Of course it cannot germinate because the roadway is compacted soil. It is not meant, it is not prepared for the seed. So the birds come by mm -hmm. and the Bible says, what it says here, this is he who we see seed by the wayside because when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was done in his heart. For whosoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have the abundance. But whosoever does not, does not have, even what he has will be taken away. So before the seed can get a chance to germinate in the ground, the birds eat it up. The birds take it away. It's the same thing with the word of God. The seed that fell on the roadside, before a man can even begin to contemplate upon it or act upon it, the enemy, Satan, snatches it away from them. But it goes back again to our topic, prepared or for or before for glory. From these scriptures, Matthew 13, 10 to 17, and Matthew 16, 12 to 20, when he speaks about who the mercy that I am, where he says that, you are Peter, and upon it I build my church, and I give you the keys to the kingdom. All these scriptures is showing you that through election, God is preparing the people for himself by election. So, election is based on the good pleasure and the sovereign will of God. We got to remember this all the time. However, election anticipates some things. It anticipates that God is going to reject some, and he's going to gather to himself a remnant both Jew and Gentile. I just want to read also John 11, 40. Let's look at John 11. John chapter 11, verse 40. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Simple statement. He's speaking to the martyr. He said that Pishuo means to believe. If you believe, 
you will see the glory of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you believe, you will understand the word of God. If you believe, it has been given unto you to understand the mystery of the kingdom of God. But you must believe. You must repent and believe the gospel. If you don't believe, the gospel cannot do anything to you. The Bible said that. They, what did they do? They closed their ears, right? And they closed their eyes so that they cannot see. Many people are closing their eyes to the gospel and closing their ears. Are you one of them? Are you willing to open your eyes and see? If you don't open your eyes, you cannot see. A blind man will walk and he will stumble and he will fall. So do not close your eyes. Do not close your ears when the gospel comes. That is what we are talking about. Because as soon as the word of God comes, there's an enemy out there waiting to take it away from you. It doesn't get a chance to get into your understanding. You see, we're not talking about into the heart only. We're talking about in the understanding now. Into the will. Because you cannot do anything until you understand. And it gets into your will. So it can soften your will. So that you can know, say, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Because, because a sinner is rebellious and he's self-centered. But God's word come to break that yoke. Of bondage and deliver you. Also, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to read something here. Now we can move on. 1 Corinthians 2 from verse 9 to 16. See, this is very important. But as it is written, eyes have not seen. Now you see now? Now ears heard. Now have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Remember he says, say, don't blind your eyes. And your ears are dull. But eyes, no eye, natural eye, no natural ear, now have not entered into your heart, into your mind, into your understanding, into your intellect, into your memory, into your imagination, the things that God has prepared. Because Why? Look at verse 10. But God has revealed to them to us by his spirit. It has been given unto you mm -hmm. to understand the mystery of the kingdom. By the, spirit. by the spirit. So eyes will not see. Ears will not hear. Uh, from your own imagination or intuition or your intellect or your reasoning or your, or your knowledge, you will not know. You will not perceive. See? But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. It has been given unto us to understand the mysteries of the kingdom because God is preparing us for glory beforehand. Before we get to that point of transitioning into the spiritual kingdom, God is preparing us in the natural realm. Simple. For what man knows the thing of a man? Except the spirit of a man which is in him. An animal don't know what's in the heart of a man. He has an animal spirit. But we have a spirit of man. We, have re we can reason. And I like what you are always talking about. The soul. You know the soul of man. You can reason. You have a personality. You have memory. You have imagination. So, only a man can think like a man then. Only a man can understand things that pertain to man. Even no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. You cannot know anything about God except by His Spirit. But it's the Spirit that takes the Word and gives it life. And makes it, makes it like under, that we can understand it. The Word, Jesus said, the words I speak to you, they are Spirit. India. And they are alive. They are not natural then. Because Jesus was making a statement. He was saying that I am the bread of life. Mm -hmm. That came down from above. He said if you eat my flesh. And drink my blood. You are my disciple. The words I'm speaking to you. They are spirit. Right. And they are life. You must understand them from a spiritual perspective. That they are not natural. You don't look at it from the natural. But you must use the spiritual Understanding, but wait a minute. 
Where does that spiritual understanding come from? The Holy Spirit. Amen. And if and if you are not part of the kingdom, you will not understand. You will not have that spirit of understanding. The eyes of your understanding being opened. You see, Paul says it in Ephesians. He said, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened because it's open that you may know the hope of your calling. If your eyes are not open, you will not know. Even though God holds back his spirit from you, you still have a conscience. Your conscience is one that is going to judge you between right and wrong. But sin now contaminates your conscience and, and like pollutes it. So your, your like judgment is going to be faulty anyway. If a, a word happened to fall your way from God, when a man is speaking, before you can even contemplate it, it's gone. What man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we, you see that? Have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words, which man wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not, does not, does not receive the thing of the Spirit of God. For they are foolish to him. That's why he just said, the man is preaching, you are saying that's foolishness. What is he talking about? He's talking nonsense. Why? Because it is spirit. The word that he's speaking it is spirit and life. But you don't have spiritual understanding. So to you it's foolishness. That's why it says there. Clearly. The natural man does not receive the thing of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them. You cannot know them by searching for them in the dictionary. Or on the internet. Or on Google. You cannot know these things. Because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is really judged by no one. For who has known the mother of the Lord that he may instruct him? But what did he in, in with? But we have the mind of Christ. So we can understand what Christ is talking about. We don't instruct him, but we pray to him. We plead to him. We, we ask him. We commune with him. We have fellowship with him. We have an understanding. By the Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. the love of God, and the communion of the flesh of the Holy Spirit is with us for all times, always, even unto the end of the age, in other world. Amen. Hallelujah. So election proves that God does not see any difference between nations as God prepared beforehand vessels of mercy, whom he called partly from the Jews and partly from the Gentiles. Now let's look at some scriptures here. And this is going to be important. Psalms 37. Let's go to Psalms 37. Remember we are talking about prepare beforehand for glory. But God has made it possible for us to be made ready. But look at Psalms 37. 37? Yeah. Psalms 37. 27 or 37? 37. 37. 1 to 17. Do not fret because of evildoers. Mm -hmm. Now be evidence of workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass. Remember, the vessels of wrath prepared beforehand for destruction, are fitting for destruction. Let's use the correct terminology as the Bible uses it. The vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. So, what is the Psalms admonishing us? Do not fret yourselves because of evildoers. Now be envious of the workers of iniquity. Don't envy the wicked. When you think that he's prospering and he's got a lot of money and wealth and position and power, do not envy him. Because why? For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. But what should you do? 
Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Feed on the Lord. Trust in the Lord always. He said, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desire of your heart. What is my desire? Last week, I asked that question. What is your desire? And you said to me, eternal life. That's right. That's what you said, right? That's right. So that is mine too. So my desire is not earthly. No. It is not material wealth no. or material gain. It is eternal life. Amen. Heavenly existence <laughs> with the Lord. That is my desire. And he will grant that. Because that is his purpose and his will for me. Okay. See? So once that is his purpose and will for me, it will happen. And I understand that. Because what? He has given me eyes and knowledge to understand the things of the kingdom. He said, commit your ways to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. You see that, Pastor Peter? When you commit your ways to the Lord... He will bring that desire, and what is your desire? Eternal life. He will bring the past. Amen. Amen. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Mm -hmm. Now he said, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Those that wait upon the Lord yes. shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings and eagles. Mm -hmm. They shall run. And not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You shall not faint by the wayside then. You shall not give up hope. Hallelujah. You shall not say, you know what? This salvation is worthless. You shall not say that. You shall rejoice in the Lord always. And again, you will, I will say, rejoice. Hallelujah. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. He said, do not fret because of evildoers. Don't worry about Bill Gates and and Zuckerberg and, and Jobs and whoever. Mm. Wait, they shall soon be cut off and wither like grass. Hey. Unless, they come to the Lord. Unless they repent and come to, and come to the truth. Hallelujah. All your money is worthless before God. And you know something, to be honest with you, they have the reward. That is all they're going to receive. Mm -hmm. When a man have a bonus now, most often, that is all he's going to receive. That's it. I say he has his consolation now. And it's, it's for a moment. It's, it's, it's fleeting then. That's why he said it's like grass. It's green. And in a, in a moment of time, it cut down his, and it withers. I remember I went to way to the Caribbean for a couple of weeks. My grass, I left it, was green, Pastor Peter. Mm -hmm. It was green, green, green. They had a couple of days of some hot, dry weather. When they come back, the grass is dry and brown like, like this carpet. Uh -oh. It died. So, you know, that's how, that's how wealth is. One moment you're, you're flourishing, and then tomorrow you're bankrupt. Everything is gone. Consumed away by, by lust and by greed and by, and by wickedness and by Satan. But God allows it. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his ways. Because of, of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Mm -mm. Oh, these wicked things that they don't they don't worry about it. Don't fret yourself. Let them continue with their abortion and their transitioning and whatever they want to do. Let them continue their way. Let them continue their legalization of drugs and marijuana and, and the kind of drug that will bring ecstasy to a man's heart. Let them continue. So cease from anger. For mm -hmm. so see graph. Mm -hmm. Again, do not fret. It only causes harm. It stress yourself. Why are you stressed out? Why, why? David said, So why are you discomforted inside me? Why are you why are you fretting? Why are you cast down? He said, Hope in God. Hope down in God. So why are we fretting? Do not fret. Do not be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. But with prayer and, and thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Amen. So don't fret yourself because of evil doors. For evil doors shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Their meat shall inherit the earth. 
For yet a little while and the wicked shall be no more. It seems long. It seems long. It seems painful. It seems hurtful. But a little while, you know, because we are comparing now against eternity. Against the everlasting things of God. Long life. A little while past, the Peter, they're going to be gone. And there shall be no more. You see, again, the wish that you have now will be no more. That's all you're going to have. Because you're certainly going to have eternal life. You're certainly going to have no consolation and peace in, in the afterlife. You're going to be tormented for days and days and days and years and years and years. In fact, the Bible says forever and ever. It says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully. See that? For his place, but it shall be no more. You're going to look for him, and you can't find him. Again, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The meek shall be at rest in God's kingdom, enjoying all the benefits and the bounty of his goodness. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. You're going to say, oh, wait a minute, does God laugh? It says right there. God is laughing at you. Full of yourself. Full of yourself. <laughs> you think that you're somebody, and God is laughing at you. I'm laughing at you too. Yeah. You are obnoxious and wicked and evil. You're under God's condemnation, under God's judgment, and you are not willing to repent. You're calling me a fool. Why don't you shut up? You don't know what he's talking about. You know, you know, like I, I, I can do whatever I like. I'm my own person. This is my own, This is my body. I can do whatever I like with it. Who are you to tell me any different? And I'm telling you that the Bible says that the way of sin is death, but God can offer you eternal life. And you said that's foolishness. Well, have it your way. You know, listen to me. A preacher doesn't come to force anything into your intellect. He speaks the word. The Holy Spirit, when he's ready, and you are, as I say, elect, and he's ready to, to bring you all of that, he will, by his power and by his grace, do the transformation. I cannot transform you. I can do speak the word. Again, Pastor B, it's like, it's like the saw, sowing the seed. He has no control where the seed goes. I mean, it falls. That is not his concern. He sowed the seed. But look, some fall on stony ground, some fall on tiny ground, some fall on the wayside, but some will fall on good ground. And they will bring forth fruit. But the, the object is that the fruit will remain. Three times. The bird eat up, the stony ground, the fruit did not remain. It drummed for a little while, but because of lack of soil, it withered away and died. The tiny ground, it, it germinated for a little while, but the cares of life, the thorns grew up and choke out that life. And as I say, the, you got a lawn. You got the best lawn in the neighborhood. You put a lot of time and effort in it. And it's always weeds. Ask yourself, where does these weeds come from? When you prepare the soil, you go and you prepare it. You know another thing about soil? If you prepare soil, and you don't plant anything in it, what's going to happen? In a couple of weeks or days, it's been full of weeds. Yes. Where did the weed come from? Uh -uh. That's nature. It is it's like the farmer that went and planted his wheat, and in the night, the enemy come and planted tears among his wheat. It's always going to be Wickedness in the world. You cannot get rid of it. But the point of the matter is you cannot prepare ground and leave it vacant. It must be planted with seed, proper seed. It must it, it goes back to the to the statement that Jesus made that when a man is full with a with a demon and a demon is cast out, That's right. and the demon wanders in all the desolate places and cannot find a place to rest. He's, he is de determined to go back to that place where he was before. 
When he comes back, he, found, he finds the man at the house. It's swept and clean. But it is not occupied. And he goes and he finds seven other demons worse than himself. Mm -hmm. And the state of that man is worse than before. So when the Holy, the Holy Spirit must infuse himself in you. We use that word infuse. The Holy, Holy Spirit must dwell in you. If the Holy Spirit does not dwell in your heart, your heart richly, Satan will dwell in your heart. Hey. Either the Word of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you, or Satan will dwell in you. Lust, deceit, envy, murder, robbery, rape, fornication, adultery, or lasciviousness will dwell in you. For out of the abundance of the heart, man speaks. If your heart is not filled with the word of God, what are you going to speak? But the things of the world. Lustful things, hateful things, wicked things, amorous things. You're going to blaspheme against God. The Lord laughs at him, for I see his days coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent the bow. You're ready to kill, right? Mm -hmm. To cast on the poor and needy. To slay those who are of upright conduct. Their own sword shall enter their own heart. They had their sword prepared. They had their bow drawn back. The arrow, instead of going towards you, the righteous, it will come back into their own heart. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of, the, of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. And the Lord knows the days of the right, and the inheritance shall be forever. We can stop there. A little with contempt is great gain. That's right. So do not fret yourself because of evil doers, or do not be envious of what they have. See, they have abundance now. As I said, it's temporal. You, you have a little with contentment is great gain. You have contentment. You have peace of mind. You have rest. You have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You have God's hands protecting and keeping you. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 23, verse 17. It says, do not, from verse 17, do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. For surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. There is going to be a time of judgment, Pastor Peter. There is a hereafter. There is eternity. That is what I used to be concerned about. Hear my son and be wise. And guide your heart in the way. We can stop there. Do not let your heart envy sinners. Mm -hmm. But be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. Mm -hmm. For surely there is a hereafter. And your hope will not be cut off. When you put your trust in God. Your hope will not be cut off. Those that, as I said, wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. As you, as you read in Romans chapter 5, mm -hmm. hope make that maketh not a shame. For the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it's the power of God under salvation. Because why? We believe it. Psalm 73. Chapter 73. From verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel. Not only Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no pants in their death. But this term is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. See, when circumstances come, they have money to help them out. That's what he's talking about. Now, are they plagued like other men? Plagued with like poverty and, and, and like sickness and diseases because they have, the, they have the means that they can like relieve themselves of these discomforts. Therefore, pride serve as their necklace. Violence cover them like a garment. They have more than the heart could wish. See that? They have more than the heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set them up against heaven. They speak against God himself. And their tongues walk through the earth. Therefore his people return here. 
and, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is their knowledge in the most high? Because these are the ungodly. These are the ones that are vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. Who are at ease? You see, they're at ease. They don't have no concern, no care at all. They're not worried about anything. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain. And have washed my hands in innocence. Now, until, until uh, I went to the house of the into Lord. the sanctuary of God, ah! then I understood their end. Surely, you have set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terror mm -hmm. as a dream when one awakes. You shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continuing with you, and you hold me in your hand. We can stop there. <laughs> so you see, fret not yourself because of evil doer, because soon they will cut off. You complain. Don't complain. Hey, that's, that's a... The verse says he was like he was like envious of them. <laughs> He said, until he went to the house of God, until the Spirit of God revealed truth to you, yeah. you will envy the wicked. That's right. You will be, you will be like, like oppressed and cast down. Because that is what Satan does. He, he makes you look at your circumstances. Look at yourself, where you are. You, you, are, you are a Christian, and you are the impoverished one. Where is this God? You pray and God doesn't answer. There's no help for you. No, don't think like that. Let the Holy Spirit infuse life in you and understanding in you. Hope. Hope does not make a shame. They will be ashamed. They are the ones that is going to be laughed at. And God's going to laugh at them. Be still and know that God is God. Stop. Take a moment and, and, and relax and think. God will not leave you or forsake you. He promised never to do that. And if God said that, he will, he will do it. Amen. God has not sent his son to die for nothing. We are being prepared beforehand for glory. Listen, you know, sometimes we hear these terms. Many people preach them sometimes. That we hear the term about hand to mouth. You live in hand to mouth. Yeah. You understand that African term, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, you work yes. just to eat. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Nothing else to show. Uh, they'll tell you that it's not God's will that you live paycheck to paycheck. You hear that, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Africa is number one. But let me tell you something. It is God's will that you live that way. Because if that's where you are, that's where it is God's will for your life. You know that there are more poor people in poverty than rich. You know, there are many Christians that, in that state, but what the, what the Bible say, he said that, cast your bread upon the water, because after many days you'll find it. He right. said, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, that standeth in the way of sinners, not sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, hey. and in it he does he meditate day and night. See? You shall be like the, the tree that is planted by the rivers of water that will bring forth fruit in season. That, and then the only thing is about that, that the fruit will not perish. And the, leaves will not the leaves will not wither, but it will abide forever. Hallelujah. That is the secret. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those that dwell in the secret place of the Most High God uh, shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. But the wicked are not so. Yeah, no soul. See that. They have no place. They have, they're not like that. They have no security. They have no hope. Money and wealth is not hope. It's only fit for the natural realm. Temporal. Temporal is not spiritual. You said the words I speak to you, they are spirit. And they are life. Money, gold, silver, wealth, prosperity, they are not spiritual things. Even though God used them to benefit you, but they're not spirit. They are, they, are, they, are, they are tangible. In fact, he said to store up your treasure in heaven where moth does not 
Corrupt. Our thieves do not break through and steal. Hey. That's heaven. It's in heaven. How then does God bring about his plan for the wicked and the righteous? How does he fit, as you remember, we talk about fitting for destruction, blessing of wrath. Yes. And how does he prepare us before for glory? Now, let's consider what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 19. He says that circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians 7, 19. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Both the old and the New Testament dictates that keeping the commandments of God are necessary to be in God's favor. If you want to be in God's favor, you must keep his commandments. You must be obedient. Also, Matthew 13, 23 states this. But he that receives seed in the good ground is he that hears the word and understanding it, which also bear fruit. Remember, we were talking about the sower in Matthew 13. But verse 23 say that the only person or the only thing that matters is when you receive seed in, in the good ground. Mm -hmm. Because you will hear the word and understand because it has been given unto you to understand so you will hear and understand and what will what will happen what will be the outcome you will bear fruit you will bear fruit and you'll not only bear fruit you'll bear much fruit and the fruit will remain because you are being prepared beforehand for glory you are you're the apple of god's eye you're you're fruit and god is going to harvest you and carry you into his bonds or carry you into his kingdom. 1 John 2, 3 to 4 also states. Look at it. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Now, by this we know that we know him. This is the prerequisite or the qualification. Or this is the proof that you know him. This is how you're going to say, I know God. Proof. This is the proof. Now, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. When we are obedient and we keep God's commandments, we know that we know him. There's no, there's no like, let's say, this in this fact. He who say, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whosoever keep his word truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abided in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Jesus walked in obedience. Jesus walked in love. Jesus walked in fellowship with the Father. And he wants us to walk in fellowship with him also. So this is how we know that we are in God and God is in us where we keep his commandments, where we are obedient. If you are willing and obedient, you will always eat the good of the land. Amen. Consider also John 14. Let's go to John 14. Remember John, the beloved, he wrote the book of 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and also the Gospel of John. So now let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 14, from verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. So again, the proof of love is where you keep God's word. Or where you keep the word of Jesus himself. And my father will love him. So when you keep the word of God, the father loves you. And we, look at that, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Both the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit will make their abode with us. Will bring us into fellowship with themselves. 
He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. So if you don't love Jesus, you will not keep his word. You will have no concern. You will not understand it. You will not appreciate it. You will not follow it. You will not do it. You will not. And that is how you, we can prove if we love God or not. When you keep the word of God. When you're obedient. Also, look at John 15.10. Go to the next chapter. Chapter 15, verse 10. And we can read from verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. And how do you abide in God's love? I just love by abiding his word. See? That's what we're going to tell you in verse 10. If you keep my commandment, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my father's commandment and abide in his love. So you want to abide in God's love? You must keep the, his commandments. You must be obedient then. You must not be a wayward child. You must not be rebellious and obnoxious. You must be obedient. Simple. A simple equ equation. Also, go back to, this, to John again, e epistles. Third John this time. Third John and verse 11. Third John, verse 11. One chapter, but we're going to verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. If you do not keep God's commandment, you have not seen him. You are a vessel fitted for destruction. Right? You are a vessel of wrath fitted for destruction. But if you do what is good, it means that you are being prepared beforehand for glory. See, y y look, as I said, you have been transformed into a new person. But now you must actually practice what you preach now. Remember we talked about that last week? Yeah. You must be practical now. Salvation is a practical thing. You must take what theory, what spiritual truth you have gained, have been revealed to you, and put it into practice. You must demonstrate it openly and clearly and succinctly. And not all that, but consistently. On an everyday basis. It's not a one-time thing. See, justification is a one-time thing, but sanctification is not a one-time thing. It's a continuous action and behavior. A trait. See, we have the mind of Christ. We have been transformed into the image of Christ. So we should demonstrate Christian traits or Christ-like traits. That's why you say, look. Go back to John. 15, 10. I want to make a point there. What Jesus said. John 15, 10. He says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. You know, this, this is a, a, a factual statement. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. But he went through physical things. He learned active obedience by the things that he suffered, by the things that he underwent. See? So he actually put his obedience into practice, into open, uh, open display, an uh, open demonstration. So it's the same thing with us. We learn practical obedience by what we are suffering. It's not by wealth or by money or by prosperity because you must suffer so that you can now put your faith, put your trust, put your obedience into practice. That is, how are you going to be prepared beforehand for glory? You must prove that you are obedient. You must prove that you are faithful. You must prove that you are committed. You must prove that you are loving. So how are you going to prove these things? By undergoing stressful situation. You are going to come across people that hate your guts and want to kill you. But you must still love your enemies. You must still pray for those that, that, that I persecute you. Or despitefully use you. You must still love them. 
You must still still witness and, and pray for them and, and, and preach to them. When you don't have, you must still trust God. That's what Job said. If he slay me, yes. I will still trust him. Yet will I trust him. Um, even, if I, even if I had to die, even if he kill me, all he's doing is killing my body. But he's not killing my soul. He's not killing my spirit. That is what we're talking about. Money will not do that for you. No. In fact, money will take your mind away from God. Because wealth is deceitful. And many people are led astray by the deceitfulness of witches. The thing that they have arrived. But you arrive only for this life. And again, God allowed you to have these things. Because he knew that at the end, he's going to, you're going to be a cast away. Don't, don't seek to be no billionaire, Pastor Peter. Hmm. Unless it is God's will for your life. If it's God's will for your life, it will happen. Um, but remember something now. Remember something now. When you have these witches, they have a certain demand upon your life. Hey, you will not even sleep in the night. <laughs> <laughs> Wealth and prosperity have its demands on you. On you. But the Bible says, seek ye first, it the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and everything else will be added to you. <coughs> everything else that pertains to life and God will be added to you. That is what is important. So we have the evidences here. Also look at Matthew 12, 50. We're not finished yet. There's some more scriptures that can prove my point. Matthew 12, 50. You know, let's, read it, let's look, look at it from verse 46. So we get to understand what Jesus was talking about. While he was still talking to the multitude, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, Look, your mother... And your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hands towards his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So if you do God's will, you're God's son, but you're also the, the brother of Jesus. He, he, he considers you as a sister, uh, a mother, true mother. The point of the matter is that he expects you to be obedient. You must follow his commandment. Because if you follow and obey his commandment, it means that his love is in you. And once his love is in you, then, then you are going to show forth spiritual traits. You will do what is right. John 8, 31. This is the last one we're going to read. Put into this particular statement. John chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believe him. You see that? Remember we were talking about your belief? If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We're not even going to we're not going to go any further than that. But if you read if you read further, it will give more enlightenment to your heart. But we're going to stop there because we are talking about the word, the commandment of God. How are we going to now reach that place where God is going to prepare us as vessels for glory? What is the method that God uses? One of them is obedience, commandment. You must obey God's word. You must keep His commandments. Because the Old Testament demanded it. In the Old Testament, if you didn't follow the command of God, what happened? You was destroyed. New Testament demands obedience also. But from a different perspective now. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna see the distinctions in a minute. We're going to see them. These various scriptures prove that keeping and obeying God's command are prominent. And mandatory characteristics of the heirs of eternal life. If you do not keep God's commandment, that means that you're not heir of salvation. You're none of His. However, living a moral religious lifestyle in ordinary times without any duress is not necessarily proof of eternal life. You talk about you talk about um, religious. You're not a religious person. Mm -hmm. You have a relationship with God. That's right. But there are other religious religious people. 
There are a lot of people that are moral, that live moral lifestyles. But listen to again to this statement. Living a moral and religious lifestyle in ordinary times. When everything is going good. When everything is going smooth. There's no pressure. There's no depression. There's no, there's no like loss of wages. There's no illnesses and diseases in your, in your family or your life. Everything is good. So you're, 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 you're showing forth. You're exuding like, like moral traits and, and re a religious nature. Pious. You're pious. Yes, See? But he said, without any Jewess, is not <laughs> necessary proof of eternal life. Neither perfect obedience to the law. You know what? Paul said that he was blameless. He said, before the law, blameless. Yeah, Pharisee, Pharisee. Pharisee, the Pharisees. <laughs> Philippians 3.6. We're going to read from verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concern, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted laws for Christ. Oh. You can stop there. Because I want to make a point. So you can, you can be the most zealous person in observing the law. That ain't going to get you nowhere. Now look at Romans 2, verse 6 to 8. Go to Romans now, chapter 2, verse 6 to 8. We can read from verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up, for yourself, wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now, verse 6 is what we want to get to. Who will render to each one according to his deeds? Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness. Indignation and wrath. We can stop there. So now, God is going to render to you whatever you deserve. So your lifestyle must fit the criteria that God demands. Absolute obedience. Consider Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 to 10. Galatians 6, 6 to 10. Let who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For what, whatever man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of his flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary with doing good. For in due seasons we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So do good. Do what is right. Be obedient then. Be loving. Be kind. Be generous. Be faithful to the end. And when you are faithful to the end, you will reap a crown of reward. Look at Revelation 2.10. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. See that, Pastor Peter? <laughs> if you are at that point, you are about to suffer. Do not fear those things. Indeed, the devil is, is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Be faithful unto the end. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Salvation demands that you endure to the end. It's not a momentary thing. See, your word must endure. You know the waste is not for the swift. 
The battle is not for the strong, but he that endures to the end. Listen, this is not the race that you see on board runs. The 100 meter, 200 meters, that you can blow through and win in record time. It is not tennis like Serena Williams. It is not football like Tom Brady. See? It is not for a moment of exuberance, but who endures to the end? You must have stain power. That's why Paul said, stand fast in the liberty. Where you have been made free and don't become entangled again in the yoke of bondage. The crown of eternal life is only promised to those who fight and overcome. You must fight, Pastor Sita. It is a fight that you're in. That you're in. But you're not, you, you must overcome all the deficiencies of life then. All the hindrances. All the temptations. All the trials. All the passions of life. You must overcome them. But God does not leave you alone. He gives you the way of all. You're being prepared beforehand for glory. So these things are just making you stronger. Consider what Jesus states in Matthew 5.20. He says, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness, and see the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why Paul said he was Concerned the law, blameless. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. But he said, you know what? All oh, that come as done so that I may win Christ. The Pharisees were some of the most religious people in the world. As pertained to the law. To the law, you see that? But as pertained to the law, they were very religious. They were very observant then. But he says that that is not even enough. Except. Our righteousness exceed, exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. We will by no means, he said, by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Hey. So how does obedience affect our salvation? Why is obedience so much in demand? How does it really affect our salvation? This is something we got to understand. In the first place, we are not justified by obedience. Obedience has nothing to do with your justification. Having therefore been justified by faith, faith we have peace with God. So in the first place, we are not justified by our obedience. Or in other words, obedience does not confer on us a justifying righteousness. It doesn't. Only faith does that. According to Romans 5, 1, we are justified by faith. In other words, we are justified by faith alone and not by works. Romans 11, 6. See, justification is nothing to do with obedience. Romans 11, 6. And if by grace, then it is no longer work. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Obedience is not accepted by God as righteousness. In the moment, it says that Abraham believed God. And what did God do? God counted his belief as righteousness. But God does not count your obedience initially. We're talking about initial state now, right? That was initially. God doesn't say, oh, this man is, is obedient, so I'm going to count him as righteous. There's a reason why. Ephesians 2, verse 1 says this. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Before you are justified, you are in a state of spiritual death. You are spiritually dead. So you cannot use obedience as the mechanism to follow God. Because you, you will not obey Him. Your obedience is, is, is filthy. It's not, it's not true obedience. So obedience is not accepted by God as righteousness itself. As the old covenant demanded. The old covenant demanded obedience. Neither is it the prerequisite for God to impute Christ's righteousness to us. Consider that at the point of conversion, all are dead in trespasses and sin. We need to be quickened to life 
then we are justified by faith. Having therefore been justified by faith, we have peace with God. But how does obedience affect our salvation? Is it necessary? Of course it is. Consider then that at a point of regeneration and justification, Christ's righteousness is imputed to us by faith. However, once we have this saving faith imparted to us, the necessary attributes of faith will follow, which will be obedience and love. When you have faith, Pastor Peter, implanted in your heart, you will be obedient. Because faith now demands obedience to do what? To serve God. To work. To be sanctified. It is not necessary to be justified. But once you are justified by faith, your faith must work. Because faith without work is dead. That is what James said, right? Then consider that both faith and obedience are necessary elements of salvation. As faith is necessary for justification, while obedience is mandatory and an attribute of our sanctification. You know how you are sanctified? Through obedience to the word and by the spirit. So obedience brings about holiness in your life. It brings about sanctification in your life. So obedience is a deed with your sanctification. Why faith is a deed with your justification. Faith, faith lets us to the door. You know what faith does to you? It brings you to the door. It opens the door for you. But now what happens? You have to walk, right? How do you walk? You walk by faith, but also by obedience. Because faith will demand obedience. Obedience without faith is dead. Faith let us through the door. What obedience is necessary for our daily walk? Obedience is the way to eternal life. If you don't follow that obedient pathway, you will never get to the end, which is eternal life. The same Jesus that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but by me, is the same that said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Confirm, remember, read it in 1 John 5, 3. Let's look at 1 John 5, 3 for a minute. Just briefly, quickly. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandment, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So we must be obedient. Righteousness comes by faith. While holiness is a part of obedience, without which no one can see the Lord. Look at two scriptures we're going to read quickly, and we're going to be finished. Hebrews 12, 1 to 4. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Look at under Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. So you're going to undergo pressure. You're going to undergo temptation, you're going to undergo trial, you're going to undergo pain. But consider that Jesus bore all these things for our sake. So we must be obedient to his word. We must follow him. If we want to get to the end, we must follow the pathway that leads to life eternal, which is the word of God, which is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 11. This is where, where the preacher... Solomon made a statement. He says this. I returned and saw on the sun that the race is not for the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the men of understanding, 
Now favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. For man also does not know his time. Like fish tickled in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, so the sons of men are snared in an evil time, which when it falls suddenly upon them. So the race is not for the swift, not the battle for the strong, but those that endure to the end. There is justifying faith and sanctifying faith. Justification is a work that is by faith alone, while sanctification is a product of the inner working of the Holy Spirit. Who produces the outward work of faith? Love, obedience, fellowship, worship, praise, discipline, character, and such like, as we trust in the complete work of Christ for our salvation. So you must display spiritual traits outwardly. There's the inward work by the Holy Spirit, but then you must take that inward work and transmit it outwardly. Show it outwardly. Justification will always produce sanctification. Therefore, sanctification must necessarily flow from justification. One called us to peace, which is justification. The other to action. And sanctification calls you to action. One reckons or count us as righteous. Justification count us as righteous. The other makes us holy and righteous. Sanctification makes us holy and righteous. One does not increase. The other expects and produces growth. One is what God declared us as. What the other is God at work in us. God is at work in us to will and to do. To bring about our sanctification. But God has declared us to be righteous. So believe in God. Believe the gospel. Have faith in God. Trust in him. With all your heart. And lean not to your understanding. And all your way acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. But remember. You must be obedient. If you are willing and obedient. You will always eat the good of the land. But when you rebel and refuse, you'll be devoured by the soul. May God bless and keep you in Jesus' name. Amen.